My name is Saul Mahoney. I'm 15 years old. I live on Rains Island in Leicestershire. I've been here for about four years. And um, yeah, this is my first uh, sort of off-grid project. Yeah, before I came, embarked on this adventure, I um, live a bit like a lot of people in a semi-detached house. Um, I had a job in London. I was commuting from Bedfordshire. And a few years ago, started uh, sort of, I guess, mentally transitioning into an off-grid environment by feeling the need to, I suppose, take more control over my existence and how I live in terms of, not necessarily bills, but uh, just being able to live a more low-impact life, which meant doing it myself. I suppose the common perception of living off-grid is, is kind of being a recluse. But uh, living on the island here, uh, most of the year, it's kind of more like a goldfish bowl. Everybody can see what you're doing. There's no, nowhere to hide. Um, but also, actually, I, I do enjoy being part of a community as well. We've got the boating community and the villages, and you know, I know a lot of people around here. Technology is important to me. You know, we've got the internet, We've got Netflix, we've got things hooked up to cloud. Uh, and the idea was to kind of prove that a low impact living can be achieved um, on a relatively modest budget. The example being a sort of two bedrooms house. So we did that at the invitation of the local authority who encouraged me to reuse the, the old house. Uh, but now they seem to have a problem with it and are trying to stop me from living here, more of which we'll cover a bit later. Uh, in the meantime, fancy a cup of tea? Fancy a cuppa? Yeah, so, you know, how we got here and the attraction of off-grid living really came in stages. We left we left a home and moved into a narrowboat, travelled around the country sort of thing. And the, the appeal of off-grid living and low-impact living, more importantly, became uh, really attractive, you know. And so we started looking for a plot of land, and found this place. Uh, at first, when we, we arrived, uh, it was a, a blank canvas, and we had to work, get, get working pretty quickly. So it was all day, every day, really. We had to tame the place, and then start making decisions, doing research of where to go next. So it took hours, all day, every day, working towards the, the decisions and the, the ideas that we wanted to, to achieve. Um, that paid off, that planning and search paid off because when we had it all, when we installed it all and it's up and running, it's low, it's low maintenance. We don't need to, it, it sort of runs like a regular house. There's very little maintenance. Now, we spend about an hour a month on the electrics, an hour every six weeks. And I'm not even doing that, I'm plugging a pump in and uh, it's an hour for the water. But that's because we sp spent the money and the time to make sure it was as little low maintenance as possible. So that was a key thing for us, I think. Here on the island, we generate electricity using solar. We draw water from a borehole, which is filtered, so it's potable. We also collect rainwater. Um, for other uses. Uh, we grow a portion of our food here and we have compost loose, so it's very much off-grid, um, as much as you can be, really. So the house, do you want me to, uh, do you want to show you what's going on in here? 
this was this house when we when we got it, it was just a shell. There were no windows and doors. It was just a roof, a floor, and bricks. That was it. And uh, so we the windows and everything were all kicked out. And, uh, and there was no electricity, no wiring, no water pipes or anything in here. So we had to just sort of do it all from, from scratch. And then just through here, it's all LED lights. Um, lots of spiders. And when I first moved here, well, I never used to like spiders. I used to be pretty, like a lot of people, a bit like, ugh, afraid of them. But I kind of learned to live with them. Um, especially when I was on my own, they were like, uh, you know, like friends. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did see them, you know, when you, when a hornet comes into your house and you're like, what am I going to do with that? And then you see it get caught in a net, uh, a web, uh, and they can't get out of it. It's quite, it's not satisfying, obviously, but it's better to have them die that way than, um, than having to swap them or open doors and running around. So, yeah, the spiders have been friendly. They're all right. You get used to them. So this is where we grow our veg our uh, growing area we keep everything in rotation through the four different sort of crop types and uh, we don't use weed kill or anything and this is the polytunnel um, where we grow tomatoes and all more exotic fruits as it were huge we had one of these it was 750 grams <laughs> We didn't plant anything this year. It's all from last year's tomatoes, which is great because you just turn up and they're on their way. <laughs> we had to figure out what sort of power we'd need and how much, uh, cause it's basically a numbers game. And uh, we had this shed built with the panels on top and we had to basically get it all manufactured locally and ship it over here on a boat. Everything's got arrived by boat. And these is a fork, it's a one forklift truck battery with two, uh, 24 two volt cells, each weighing about 60 kilos each. So it's quite a quite a hefty sort of um, procedure to get them in here. Yes, yeah, kind of strange this because I use this uh, these. These bricks as my uh, water gauge. It's a, I need to get another one because usually I stand on there in the flood and, and kind of try and peer over here. But it gets to a certain point and it stops because the whole uh, floodplain is is then kind of filled up. But I know if it starts going above that, a lot of people are going to be in trouble in the villages around here because I've sort of seen it edge up before and then ah, we're all flooded. And people, people have had to move out of the house for like 18 months because they got a thatched cottage was flooded and it's like half a mile away at least over in the village. But this is the gauge because it's right in the middle of the, the whole floodplain. I keep, I keep getting to a point where I want to tell them I can warn them. And now that I've moved off grid, I certainly have more control over my life. Um, it has taken a long time to get here and a lot of effort um, but once everything's in place and once everything became in place, I, it gave me more time to pursue the things that I really, you know, really want, wanted to do and want to do. Tool shed, you have to have tools for everything, everything and anything. There's absolutely no point in, in having a place like this if you can't maintain it yourself. We don't get a man round or a lady or anybody. So. Yeah, rainwater, collect rainwater. And this is actually, it's just for clothes washing. Use it in the washing machine, but it's clean. It's damn side cleaner than what comes out. It certainly does the job. <laughs> you can just see our nearest neighbors up there, just through the, through the, <laughs> and they're on narrow boats. The reality of the case is the, the council um, have a problem with me being here. They didn't know the place existed and now they're trying to kind of kick me off. They want me to take everything down and not live here. So 
four years after moving into the empty home, um, the council got in touch, said we're changing the use of the property to residential and they are essentially trying to kick me off for that. So they put their, their uh, statement up here. I put my version of events on there just for balance for the general public because everybody's coming along here and you know making a judgment so I thought it was only fair and that's what we've got. This notice is issued by the council because it appears to them that there's been a breach of planning control. Bloody blah de blah. Uh, without planning permission the change of use of the land to residential use and the erection of buildings and structures associated with the residential use. The nuts thing about this is not just the planning aspect, but the council themselves asked me to reuse this empty building. Uh, and they wrote to me about it. And I, uh, uh, that's all I've done. And now they've got a problem with it four years later. <laughs> hey. I'm writing to you in respect of the above property as part of the council's efforts to encourage the reoccupation of houses currently standing empty. It is hoped that bringing these homes back into use will improve local areas and by making the best use of the existing housing stock, reduce the demand for greenfield site development. To achieve this aim, we are currently reviewing our records and identified that you appear to be the owner for the above property, currently registered as having been unoccupied for six months. There was a form with it which offered a grant, should I need any, but we didn't, so we confirmed that we were going to reoccupy the empty homes supporting the Housing Act 2004. Controversial, I think. It's, uh, you know, asking you to do one thing and then telling you you're doing something unlawful and threatening you with a £20,000 fine is, is pretty harsh, <laughs> I think. So there we go. So what we have on top of that is the council saying, I'm changing use to residential, yet we've had residential council tax paid on it for over 30 years. The council are saying that we're affecting the environment, but um, we actually intend to prove that we've increased biodiversity. Um, the council are saying it, it's a, it can affect floods, affected by floods and can affect floods. And we have built flood, flood resilience here. And again, we intend to prove that um, this is not a problem because the building has been here for hundreds of years and it's been used in various capacities by humans um, for all that time. We found this map from 1835 and on it is the island. Um, we know the island was created in um, 1793, but this Ordnance Survey map of 1835 shows the building on it. And if you zoom in, you can see the island with a building on it. Ta-da! <laughs> there it is, 1835, mapped. Official records. But what was it used for? What was going on? I don't know. But I still have to prove it. I still have to find out what the purpose of the building was.
COVID pandemic, obviously terrible time for everybody, but uh, due to the restrictions and everything, the council have asked me to put my own uh, warrant up. <laughs> my own notice of execution, as it were, for the public to see. It's actually a public hearing notice, so I oh, maybe shouldn't have said that. It's actually the, a notice about the case. Oh God, hang on. Only happy to oblige. So yeah, so this was this is on the telegraph pole that the previous owners had put up to service the house. Yeah, no evidence of anybody wanting to live there. No, <laughs> just a telegraph pole. <laughs> the planning officer told me this. No matter what happens, the result of the hearing, at the result of the hearing, they they can't stop me from going to the island every day. They've, they've said that, so I have to I have to kind of understand them what context. I can stay there and go there every day. Uh, I, d I do wonder in whose interest it is that they're pursuing this case because I've lowered my, my carbon footprint, living in a much, more, much healthier environment. But the fact is, if they get their way, I cannot avoid increasing my my carbon footprint, I cannot avoid an outcome that is worse in every shape or form for the council and for me. So what are the, what are the outcomes? If the council get what they want, their revenue will reduce because I won't pay council tax on a property, which is bizarre. That's what I said right at the beginning is just think about the alternative. Um, and if they get what they want, it's in nobody's interest. Certainly not mine, obviously, but. Oh, here's another notice, look. Wanted. Heathen island dweller. When we bought the island, I, I worked at Disney. Uh, I've been there 20 years, a bit over, and uh, obviously buying the place, uh, I did think at one point I could do both, but it, it was too much. So I decided to leave Disney and figure out where to go next from there. I did that for two years, then ended up going back in the industry, um, working again in cinema technology and post-production. Uh, and then with the pandemic, uh, like a lot of people, I got made redundant. And then this happened. Uh, the enforcement happened. Now, due to my redundancy, <clears throat> I felt the, the best thing I could do is sort of set up my, set up a company. And I had a few ideas that I wanted to 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 work on and uh, and offer something new um, but it was something or it was something I could do from the island um, but this appeal and this enforcement has basically soaked up all my time and energy I've managed to still manage to work on a business plan and when the appeal's over I, I'll be quite happy because, it'll, first of all, it'll free up a lot of my uh, headspace and I can concentrate on running my business and growing that and doing something I enjoy. Um, but 
the result of the appeal doesn't really affect that. Um, actually, all that all that means is that the appeal and the enforcement is just a chapter in in the history of the island. It's uh, whilst it's been ch challenging and sapping of energy <laughs> and finances, it's not the end of the world. It will. It will Things will continue. I'll continue, and this is just one of those uh, points in life that are there to be overcome. It's just to be overcome. That's all. And uh, yeah, it'll be all right. <laughs> just had the hearing um, followed by a site visit uh, it seemed to go okay it lasted two days um, both sides with uh, our, our expert witnesses uh, we had ecology covered the planning history the flooding elements everything was covered quite you know pretty well um, but we won't hear anything we won't hear the result of the case until um, for about four weeks uh, so until then we'll just sit tight the, the effect on my well-being since having the enforcement notice was quite um, it was pretty stressful um, quite a lot of anxiety. The, the fact that it was it was done in a time of a pandemic, I just couldn't believe anyway. But so we had that compounded. It was a very very complex case, and it, yeah, I, I I had a lot of uh, so many sleepless nights. It became the way I was living to the point that I actually got some sleeping tablets running up to the up to the hearing because I just was not sleeping um, and when we had the site visit um, I was I was told that it probably be about four or five weeks that time came and went and then we heard it could be eight or nine um, so it kind of just prolonged the agony as it were but in terms of the result uh, which I received a couple of days ago is really good news. All right, yes, because we've got plenty to talk about. Yeah, yeah we do. Um, sorry? Oh, oh no, not quite. Um, we, uh, we won the appeal. Yeah. Yeah. As in... Everything's all right, yeah. The, as in, the, um, the the inspectorate found pretty much everything in our favour. That, that's really good. There were a whole bunch of reasons given, but the abandonment argument was overturned. They didn't consider that the property had been abandoned because the previous owners had paid their council tax all the way through it. They'd showed intent to live back here. It was only through sort of personal reasons that they had to sell through the bereavement. All in all, the outcome has been really, really positive. It's, I couldn't, um, I couldn't ask for more. Now that the worry is over from the case, uh, there are still plenty more things to do. I still worry on the bigger picture about climate change and how that's going to affect the island. Although we're resilient, it, can, it could conceivably get a lot worse. So, you know, we need to figure out how, how to deal with that in future. It's always been a wish of mine that I could inspire people to do the right thing and help people kind of understand that every little contribution 
individuals can make is important. So I'd hope that, that people certainly aren't put off by what I've been through because we've proven that even through this kind of sort of ter turmoil, um, you can come through the other side and actually, uh, you know, continue making a positive change. Since coming here five years ago, I have been through quite a lot of sort of stress. I've changed my diet, I've learnt new skills, I've learnt an awful lot about nature, about gardening. Uh, I feel much healthier in the, my sort of enrichment of my being. Uh, ultimately, I feel like a much stronger person and much more able to cope with the future. I wouldn't recommend people take on too much, but you should never sort of shy away from sort of pursuing your dreams. Because they're always worth it, aren't they, Mika? Thank you. <laughs>